Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Carl Griffith from Graybar, and I want to welcome you to our G2 Talk webinar this morning, where our subject is going to be about, co about aisle containment in a data center without replacing cabinets. We know how that expensive that can be in the wallet, and we're going to show you some really neat solutions today. So we're looking, uh, looking forward to this presentation. Um, before we get started, though, I thought I would spend a little bit of time and talk to you just a little bit about Graybar. Our mission statement here is to help our customers power, network, and secure their facilities with speed, intelligence, and efficiency. Well, of course, today we're going to talk about lower power consumption because maybe we can turn a few cracks off, and we're going to talk about more efficiency as well. So it fits perfectly in what we do in trying to help data centers power network and secure with speed, intelligence, and efficiency. Before we get started, I just want to give you a, a little bit more information. This presentation will be archived on graybar.com. Uh, if you'll go up to graybar.com and click on the G2 Talk logo, you'll see an archive button there. You can go get this presentation, and you can listen to it and refer to it again, or you can take that URL and cut and paste it and send it to a colleague or someone else in the industry. Uh, so if you want to do that, a copy of the presentation will also be up on uh, the archive site. Uh, so you'll see the uh, presentation in a PDF format up there that you can uh, refer to later. If you're one of the first 50 callers to join us today and you stay with us online, you're going to get an email at the end of our presentation uh, that will allow you to get a cup of coffee uh, from a large national coffee chain uh, here in North America. So. If you would like a cup of coffee, check your uh, email. Uh, maybe you'll get one because you're one of the first 50 people uh, to be online and join us for this presentation today. We do have Q&A associated with this presentation. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you'll press that, a dialog box will open up. Please type your question in the dialog box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Those questions that we cannot answer uh, we will, uh, we will uh, respond to you via email with the answers. So before, uh, I don't want to waste too much time, so let's get going here. Our, our presenter today from CPI is uh, Tom Cabral, who's a field engineer, applications engineer with CPI. He's been in the industry, at CPI anyway, for 14 years. He has a tremendous amount of experience when it comes to cooling solutions inside data centers. He uh, told me just recently that he's visited all 100 of the Fortune 500 or 100 of the Fortune 500 data centers in the United States, it's a, or in the world, I guess, and that's an amazing, amazing thing. And so uh, he's an expert when it comes to cooling solutions inside data centers. So without spending any more time, I'm going to pass the presentation on to Tom. Tom, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, so. We're going to discuss a little bit about how you can save, you can contain your data center and, and, and enjoy some savings along the way. The first slide you see up there is our legal disclaimer. Please share this information, but make sure uh, CPI or Graybar knows about it and uh, we're part of that conversation. So here's our agenda today. I'm going to, we've identified seven key benefits of isolating your air. I'm going to run over real quick about um, the highlights of California Title 24, what that is and why we care about that. Uh, and I'm going to give you the case for containment, you know, hot aisle, cold aisle, um, hot aisle containment, cold aisle containment, or rack level containment. And then Graybar and CPI went into a customer and helped the customer out, and we're going to show you the details of that study. So first, the, the uh, seven benefits of isolating your airflow. First of all, it's going to eliminate hot spots. So if you have big, huge fans or even small fans in your data center placed it, uh, smartly placed around your data center, that, that's the first uh, sign that you've got some hot spots in your data center. So isolating or partial, partially isolating your airflow in your data center is going to eliminate that hot spots. Secondly, you can support higher and higher heat loads. We have, a cat, we have a couple of cabinets running right now currently in the U.S. at actually 42 kilowatts. So my slide says, you know, 6kW up to 30kW. We actually have a couple that are, are past 30kW and are up to 42. Also, we're going to take 
every bit of cold air that you make, that's the expensive part of this whole solution, is, is making cold air to cool down your equipment. We're going to take that and try to pass that through the server so no air is wasted. So you utilize 100% of your cold air. And then we're going to take the, your delta T, which is your, tra uh, your change in temperature. So you start with one temperature, goes through the server, and your hotter temperature on the back side. We're going to maximize that delta T so you can get the most out of your HVAC unit. So one to four, that's kind of like the starting point. Then once you get to five, now you're starting to have some real, real fun in your data center. You can increase your set points. So you cannot run your data center um, at 59 degrees or 65 degrees. You can now run it in the 70s, even all the way to 80. ASHRAE has a, a spec, spec out that it's 80.6 is the hottest that it, it could be in your cold dial. That's, that's pretty hot. So we're going to try to get those set points up. The other thing that, that, that's going to happen is then we can take advantage with those higher set points, we can do some economization. So we can try to shut our HVAC off and use outside cooling or seasonal cooling to help cool our data center. And then we're going we're gonna to be able to supply the data center from anywhere in the room. So no longer do you have to have a, a floor tile right in front of your cabinet um, right, and, and deliver the air that way. When you fully isolate your data center, the air can come in from the ceiling, the wall, the floor. It, it doesn't matter at, at a certain point. So on to Title 24. So Title 24 it was ratified in 2013. And some of the concepts that I'm going to talk to you about today, California has now made them law. So you need any, anything under five tons, you don't need an economizer. You don't need to take care of uh, outside cooling, one of, my, one of my previous slides. You don't need to, to do that. That's a pretty low load. So anything above five tons, you have to show some sort of economization, some way that you are going to be able to shut down your crack units or take outside air or use seasonal cooling to cool your water down. Also, California put in no reheating. So on some crack units, as, as crazy as it sounds, there is a reheating element on some of these crack units. I will show you in our, um, in our case study, they, they actually had a crack unit in reheat mode. So California said, no more, cannot have it on your crack unit, no chance to waste energy reheating something that you're trying to cool anyways. Humidification has to be um, non-adiabatic, meaning you cannot just heat up the water to make mist to get to get your humidification. They do a um, California has a uh, a maximum limit on your on your fan speeds. Your fan control should be variable speed. So the, most of the market, most of the customers are already on to this variable sp uh, speed fan control. So instead of just having a fan that's on or it's off, if you can ratchet that fan down just slightly, you can still get almost the identical airflow with a lot less energy that happens and, and save quite a bit of money by saving energy by just varying your speed on your fans. And then we get to what our, what our conversation here mainly is today is containment. How, how do I do it? What do I do? Well, California has said if your design load is over 175 kilowatts, you have to put in some sort of air barriers. And that's the, I, I, I put on that slide, um, shall include air barriers. That is right from the document. So they, you have to be able to segregate the airflow with no significant remixing of air. There's a few exceptions, and I bring you down to the fourth one down that exception is a, a CFD analysis. If you did a CFD analysis and you showed them your design that you can save energy or have some sort of economization or be at a certain threshold, they will allow you not to have air barriers. It, that's pretty challenging, and I'm going to say that even if you do a CFD uh, model, you, you're going to probably have some air barriers through your data center. So then how does, you know, how does the thermal, how does, how does this work? Let me start at the bottom of the slide, and I'm going to move upward. So it's, in the beginning, it's all at the rack. So you have to figure out your airflow inside. Well, first, inside the server. Is your server going right to, if you're, is your server breathing right to left? Is it breathing front to back? Is it breathing um, top to bottom? There's a lot of different ways servers breathe. They don't, sometimes they don't just breathe, which seems to be simple, front to rear. 
Um, if they re-sign the sign, we've got plenty of, uh, of ways to get around that. But that's the first, first and foremost. Then you have to contain that at the rack level. You have to figure out where your airflow is, is going. You have to use your air, your, your air dam kits, which is basically that space on the side of the rack uh, between the sidewall and your EIA, TIA mounting rails. And then you have to blank off all the, all the empty dead space inside the rack. So if there's not a server, if there's not a piece of equipment in that rack, you've got to blank that off. So it all starts there first. Then you get to the room and figure out how you can better flow your air inside your data center, inside your room. So your server first, then your rack, then your room. Take care, take care of them in that, in that order. So here's a graphic that I'm going to put up. We've, we've been showing this graphic for, for quite some years. What we're seeing from left to right is you're seeing a typical recirculated data center, a cabinet um, inside of a data center with just regular hot aisle, cold aisle. So you've got cool air underneath the raised floor, that's in blue, goes through your cabinet, and then it's starting to come around the top and it's, it's recirculating. If you did everything possibly correct that you can do inside a data center without air barriers, you could get it um, looking like the middle, uh, the middle picture. The, the colors are better, the airflow is better, but it's still not optimal. So then you have to take the next step, and that is going 100% isolation, or as far to isolation as you can get. So how, oops, I'm trying to advance my slide, sorry about that. So how can you get to that? There's a lot of things out there in containment. Um, as you can see on my graphic, one of the biggest problems is a city skyline inside of a data center. That city skyline has a multitude of issues that you can come up with. We've got some unique ways to get around that, so uh, stay tuned for in, a, in a couple of slides and I'll show you. So hot aisle containment. Here's the advantages. 90, 90 to 95% airflow containment pretty simple to retrofit in a brownfield situation, and you have the greatest volume of air increasing your ride-through mass. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you con contain the air on the back side of the cabinet in a row, you have all the spaces around the cabinet filling up with cool air, giving you a bigger air mass to, so that if you had a catastrophic failure of HVAC, you can use some of that air mass to ride through the problem. I'll show you the difference on the uh, on the cold aisle in one in, in one slide. And this this uh, hot aisle, you can do raised floor, you can do slab floor. Once you once you contain the entire aisle, we can get your uh, airflow however which way you want. You don't need to be on a raised floor or be on a uh, slab. You can be on either. It, it it doesn't matter. The challenge is when the is when the temperature starts to rise. We see right now at the back of the cabinet 114 degrees. Um, in, in some cases. It's usually above 100. At the top end, 114 is what we've seen. It is going to go in a few years hotter than that. It is going to be in the 120s in the back of the cabinet. So working on the back side of that cabinet is going to be challenging. And then you have to deploy per aisle. Now I got a few tricks around um, depo deploying per aisle, uh, but basically you have to tap off one end of the aisle, tap off the other end of the aisle, and then uh, build an entire contain containment structure down through the whole aisle. So we're going to go cold aisle containment. Now cold aisle containment, let me back up just one quick second. So hot aisle containment, we're doing like a, a, a chimney style over your cabinet going all the way up to the ceiling. Cold aisle containment, you could do a lid style going over the top of the cabinets as you see in my graphic here. We can really do either. You could do lid style or chimney style going all the way to the ceiling either way. I've contained a cold aisle containment with a chimney going all the way up to the ceiling because they needed more airflow and they wanted to trap some sprinkler heads. So we can do either. So don't get too, too wrapped around that, oh, cold aisle's lid style only. Most of the time it's a lid style. So you just, right over the top of your cabinet, you simply place a lid over, over the top of the cabinet and two doors on either end and you've contained your cold aisle. Now, on the previous slide, I said, well, you have this, this, huge, this huge air mass around the cabinets for riding through a catastrophic failure. Here, you've just capped that, and you've made that finite. Now you only have that space inside the cold aisle. So that is a disadvantage sometimes of cold aisle. You can see that in my first bullet point on challenges. Minimal ride-through time. If you have 
only a certain row width, length, and height of cold air. Once that cold air is out, you're, uh, you're in some serious trouble. You can turn minutes into seconds and not have enough time to power down your equipment. This, though, the, the lid style, the cap style, one of the advantages of that is really it is very easy in the field to retrofit. Most of the time when you're just putting a lid right over the top of the cabinet, you don't encroach on anything. Ladder rack, power busway, um, fiber runs, anything like that. So it is one of the more simplified retrofits you can do out there in, in, a, uh, in a brownfield situation. You can do it on slab floor, raised floor. I've done one where I've lit, uh, lit at a cabinet aisle and then we've piped down the cold, uh, uh, the cold air into from above. From above into the aisle so we can get the air in there it does not have to be on a raised floor my, my graphic does show on a raised floor but it does not have to be there the other limitation of a cold aisle is the CFM now when you flood air into this space if the CFM if the servers are starting to rat ratchet up and draw more CFM the floor tiles may not be able to keep up with that pace of how quickly the servers are pulling that CFM or that cubic feet per minute of air that you need. So you could be have a pressure imbalance and have um, the, the floor tiles, which is the limiting factor in, in, in my graphic here, it could be stopping you dead and you have a pressure imbalance and now you've got a bigger problem. The ducted exhaust solution is right on the back of the cabinet. You, you seal the back door, so usually it's a solid door. You go out through the ducted cabinet, or go out through the duct in the top of the cabinet, back through the crack unit, as my uh, as my slide shows. You can be on a raised floor, on a uh, on a slab floor. You can be uh, deliver the air any which way you want. It's basically like hot aisle containment, uh, but in the in the rack level. You have the maximum. If you see my third bullet point on the on the advantages, you have a maximum amount of airflow that you can do. Why is that? Is because your cold aisles are cold, but now that hot aisle that you contained in the hot aisle containment area is now another cold aisle. You're walking down it because, and it's cold because the heat is really trapped in the back of the cabinet. So you actually got some more ride through air mass time. Also, you can deploy in. Um, cabinet level only. You don't have to do every, uh, a whole row. You don't have to do a half row. You don't have to do in pairs of cabinets. If you want to bring one more cabinet into your data center, pop it up into it, uh, uh, the chimney up into the ceiling and start exhausting your air, you can absolutely do, you can absolutely do that. And I see a cu customers do a hybrid. They have equipment they can't move, so they contain that aisle. And then when they brought in a new cabinet, they bring in one new cabinet with one new chimney, and they have a hybrid solution in. The, uh, the vertical exhaust duct has some challenges around cable routing. So you almost form a wall. If you put ducts right after one right after another, like cabinets are in a row, you've got to really plan out your, your uh, pathway runs. And you might have some ceiling to height restrictions. You might be, your ceiling might be a little bit too high or too low, and it might not be the optimal for that, for that chimney, for that rack level containment. So what is the best containment? This website, Data Center 2020, Intel said there is no significant difference between hot aisle containment or cold aisle containment. What does that mean? If you go back to the word I like to use is isolation. Once you've isolated your air, the hot air is hot and the cold air is cold. The crack unit's dome, it doesn't understand which way you isolated the air, it just sees the hotter air coming back to your crack unit. So it doesn't it does not matter which which side you do. Your site may say you need to do cold aisle or you may need to do hot aisle. But for as getting efficiency inside your data center, that does not matter. What matters is how you're going to live with it. Oh, how do I get around this obstruction? Well, can I move cabinets out once I've, uh, once I've contained and I want to replace a cabinet? Can I do that in this scenario? Or how do I get around what my lighting that's already in the data center? Or how do I get around my sprinkler heads that are already in the data center? So these are, are issues that once you've isolated, in terms of energy, it doesn't matter. What matters is how you're going to live with it. And, and it's... And it's um, you need to definitely research it before you start 
any containment solution. So the city skyline, like I said, is the most prominent in a Browns field. You've got multiple different height cabinets, multiple different, uh, multiple width cabinets, multiple depth cabinets. They're all in a row. You've, you've bought a few here, a few there. They're not one, you know, one level, one height, or, or anything. And you've got to try to put a solution together. Well, here's our one set of little commercial that we can uh, have for you. We have a solution that is only eight pieces in parts, and the most brilliant thing about the whole solution is it goes together by one type of screw. It's a 3 8 threaded screw, so you can see it's already set up for a 3 8 thread all rod, too, so that you can hang stuff from a 3 8 threaded all rod. So I've got these eight pieces. I've got an extrusion. I've got a corner gusset. I've got a joining gusset. I've got a, a fascia corner, polycarbonate panels, and um, cabinet support brackets and ceiling support brackets um, and, a, and a clip to, to clip the whole thing together and obviously that one screw. With that, we can put panels up or down so we can go down and meet lower cabinets or we can go up to meet the ceiling in the same millimeter in the same inch. It doesn't matter. You, it, it's not like you're locked out. Once you've gone up with a panel, you cannot go down. If you place the extrusion um, vertical, you can, you can go left with it or you can go right with it. So I can actually build a full, what we call is a full height filler panel. Everybody in the data center has got a missing cabinet or they wanted to keep a row going and they've got a pillar right in the middle of their cabinet row, but that's a breach for airflow. That is a breach between the hot aisle and the cold aisle or the cold aisle containment or the hot aisle containment. We can make a full height filler panel with these pieces here and continue making the, the entire containment structure with just these pieces you see on your, on your screen. How do you, how do you, what do you need to put them together? All simple tools. Screw gun or a screwdriver, a, a chop saw, a miter box saw with a good metal blade. Um, and I, I usually cut the polycarbonate panel with a razor knife. I score one side, I snap it, I score the other side much like you uh, cut drywall. Or you can use that jigsaw. So you can use them either way. But they're already tools you already have, your contractor already has them, um, and you can construct just about anything that you need to construct um, with, with these tools and those eight pieces. So which containment is the best? Like I said, it is going to be how you're going to live with it. Here is some comparisons, though, and this is a great slide that's to, to to start you on your journey on which way you want to go, cold aisle containment, hot aisle containment, or vertical exhaust duct. So you want to do, you know, is it um, uh, your working environment important to you? Or is your uh, deployment and cooling important to you? Or your thermal ride through time? Remember we talked about that uh, scenario that if you contain a cold aisle, that tells all cold air that you have, um, can your system keep up with it? Or can you ride through a problem with that? If you see down on that um, second to last um, point is the cold aisle is X, that's all the cold air you have, where the hot aisle containment or the VED containment, you've got a little bit more than X, so you can ride through a problem. Or is it, you know, do you need to deploy it per cabinet, per rows, per rows of cabinet? Do you need to do a hybrid solution? Um, so these, this is a great comparison chart to start you on your journey, what's important to you. So here's our case study. So Graybar got the call and said, we have a problem with our data center. Can you help out? They said, sure. We've got Chatsworth. We can do a CFD analysis of your data center. We sent them. We have a 10-point uh, uh, questionnaire to get, the, to get the conversation rolling. We want to know stuff about your crack unit, stuff about where your airflow is coming in, what kind of problems are you having. We have a 10-point questionnaire that we sent to them, and we went out on site. You can see from this graphic that they had some problems. They had a huge cyclone in the center of their data center. They were mixing air uh, left and right. They didn't know what to do. So after our analysis, our observations, our findings were they had 148,000 CFM that they were supplying. We did the calculations with their racks and what they had in their data center, and they only needed 57,000 CFM. Crack unit number two was in reheat mode. Now go back to that California, that California Title 24, and, and Title 24 said no reheat mode. Now, 
I, I didn't mention this before, but the reason we talk about California is California is a is a huge early adopter. And once California does it, you'll be sure that other states are about to do it. Well, in this scenario, we saw crack unit number two was in reheat mode. What had happened is the supply air was going straight down into the return of the crack unit. So the supply air was already cold enough. It got into this crack unit and said, oh, it's too cold. I need to warm it up by a couple of, uh, a couple of degrees. So it reheated at two degrees and shot it back out. Matt, turn it off right away is what I told him. I said, number, number two crack in it, wasting your money already, just turn it straight off. Their delta T was two degrees. We had called the company of their crack unit, and they said, well, our crack units are rated at 22 degrees delta T. So they had 20 degrees to go. They had to change that temperature 20 degrees. Their makeup uh, air was too close to that crack unit, and that was the one that was shooting into that crack unit um, unit number two. And their their control room was on the same plenum as their as their their data center and it was screwing up all the values. So so we really told them to partition that off. So here were their actions. Here were their conclusions and actions. So they were two times at least two times over or two hundred percent. I like saying that word better because two hundred percent sounds like a better number. But two at least two and a half times oversupply. They didn't need that much supply. So we actually got them down to three crack units or they can supply it. They needed to raise the delta T at least 18 degrees. How did they do it? Before we did all this containment structure, remember I said start at the cabinet level. So we put in all their blank filler panels, we put in all their air dam kits, and we sealed off all the spots in the floor. We partitioned that control room, and we shut that crack unit number two off. What did that do for them? Here they are with four crack units with only 15% bypass air. So we blocked off all that airflow. Now, we didn't do anything crazy yet about putting partitions in, uh, above the rows. We didn't put um, doors on the end of the rows. We didn't do full containment. We just started and, and hit the low-hanging fruit on this one. We shut off four crack units, which cut their utility bill in half. They were running eight crack units. We got them down to four crack units, cut it in half, paid for the project um, immediately. I think it was a five... Um, a 5.5 month payback, so five and a half months, they paid it back. They needed to do some stuff with their HVAC, had a, had a technician come out, so we, we, we uh, included that in into the cost of the project. So here's where they were in the beginning, at eight crack units, at $92,000. When they got the four crack units, they're at $46,000. What, what was what was the single greatest thing that we did for them is we rose their delta T. So if you see on my slide here, they were at, as you recall, at two degrees delta T. That's the top on that slide right there. Their crack unit was rated at actually 22 degrees delta T. We raised that to their optimum level. And when we raised that to their optimum level, in this next slide, you can see. So I got a 10-ton labeled crack unit. I'm supplying 60-degree air. I return 70-degree air. I get 7.8 tons out of that crack unit. I didn't even get what I paid for. So the customer wasn't even get what they paid for because they only had a 22-degree delta T. Here was a 10-degree difference. They only had a 2-degree difference. So they weren't even getting anywhere close to what they were, they were um, paying for. Here, if I take that same 10-ton crack unit, go 60 degrees, return 90 degrees, I get 15 tons. Out, I get more than I paid for. So I get 15 tons out of that crack unit. And if I can go up. Now, that's a, there, there is a limiting factor inside crack units, so this chart just doesn't go on forever. There's, you know, gallons per minute through the crack unit. There's spin technology. There are limiting factors. But this one crack unit that we, we chose to show you here today, you can see that if you raise your delta T, if you get those temperatures at the hottest they can be and bring them back to that crack unit, we can get them more airflow. So I knew that we can shut down crack units as soon as we get that delta T up in that data center. And that's exactly what we did. We partitioned the air. We didn't do anything crazy. We didn't do door, uh, doors at the end of the rows. We just helped them in their cabinets and above their cabinets, and we were able to raise their delta T up at least 18 degrees to get them to shut off four crack units.
so then where do you take it where do you take it from there this is where the market wants to go is how can how can I economize how can I shut off my crack units and even um, uh, enjoy some seasonal cooling I'm sitting here in Phoenix Arizona today when I talk to you and it's it's not that it's not that warm out right now it is it is in the 60s well if I have a a, a data center that's in the 70s that wants to supply 70 degree air I can basically open up the windows if I was contained and did everything properly I can open up the windows and just take outside air in cool off my equipment and exhaust the outside air right out of the building again and I got free cooling so you know that's where we want to go with this. That's where all the big boys, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Yahoos, they're all going to reduce their energy and how they can get some sort of economization out of there. With isolation, with, with containment, they absolutely can get there. Here's a chart on the numbers of what you need to do to get there. So right in the center of that chart is, is um, in blue, 100% isolation, you can deliver 80 degree air. Well, if you go one, to, one chart to the left, you see 942 best practice. Everything's, everything is um, blocked off in your cabinet, but you have no containment. You have a pretty big swing of, of delivering your air. You could have from 65 degree air to 80.6, and you can't control that. Once you isolate it, you know you're, con you're, control you're controlling your supply air, and you can do about 80 degrees, maybe 77, maybe 75, depending on how comfortable you are and what else is contaminating that, that supply air. But once you do that, you can start economizing. And if you go down to the last row of that slide, it says ambient for economization. So if I am in, if I supply 80 degree air, I can get in the 60s. When I'm in the 60s, I can get um, in a regular data center, I can get, I can start turning off my crack units and start getting some sort of economization. And then the next slide is showing how we're using a heat recovery wheel or we're going to, how we're going to use uh, air side economization at 77 degrees to supply that, that, um, that data center. So that's where the market's going. The market wants to get rid of, not only get rid of their hot spots, but they want to get rid of their energy costs and put some savings or be able to grow their data center with what they already have. And so the final thoughts, and this is it. Start at the cabinet. Partial containment is better than none. Hot aisle might be better in most solutions, so check on that. And your lighting and your fire suppression are going to be your major obstacles. So check those out first and check your codes out in your local jurisdictions on what you have to do for fire and lighting. And that should be it. Carl? Great. Thank you, Tom, very much for your uh, time today and your presentation. Uh, we want to go to questions now. Um, so um, I'm going to take the opportunity here to read a few that have already come in. Again, if you would like, uh, if you would like uh, to review this presentation later, you can. You can go to graybar.com, uh, click on the G2 Talk webinar, uh, or G2 Talk our, uh, logo, and you can, uh, there's an archive there look for this presentation. There will also be a copy of this presentation in PDF format, uh, so you can download it and take a look at that as well. You can share it uh, with, your, uh, uh, with your friends if you want to, too. So Dennis provided some information that I thought was very insightful, and I want to read you what Dennis uh, wrote, Tom. He said, Reduce the, reducing the wasted cooling not only saves dollars in, op in OPEX, but it frees up power that can be allow added servers uh, improving the use of capital, and that's absolutely right. If you can if you can take money and save it in energy, that gives you money that you can use for other items inside your data center. You want to add another blade server, save enough energy uh, to cover the cost of your blade server, and you can add it in there. So Jeff makes a very good point about this whole thing about saving energy in OpEx uh, frees up uh, capital that we can do for other projects. So I thought that was uh, um, that was a good um, uh, comment Absolutely. here. The other the other one. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. I was going to say that, yeah, you don't have to just pocket the money. Now you have excess capacity. You have power that now you thought you were out of power. Now you can, you have power to do whatever else you want. You become 
you can grow within that same data center when maybe you thought you were out of it before. So you don't have right. to just save the money and pocket the money, absolutely, and grow, grow with inside the data center and just add whatever else you need, absolutely. Okay. Scott asked a question about Title 24, and he wants to know if Title 20 of 24 applies only to new construction or does it impact existing rooms and equipment? How does that work if you're doing an upgrade in a data center, uh, Tom? If you're, if you're doing an upgrade in a data center, um, most of the data centers are, are grandfathered in unless you go you build that data center above that hundred the, the add-ons are going to be above that hundred and seventy five kilowatts so if you're if you're adding just one crack unit or if you're adding a few cabinets or anything like that you're grandfathered in for for right now you do not have to go but if you if you go above that that threshold they're going to look at you and you pull your permits they're going to look at you as a new build and they're going to want you to retrofit um, a lot of the stuff all right great Dan asks a question about what exactly is considered partial containment. Now, in my experience in data centers, I've seen people uh, hang curtains from ceilings and do some other things to redirect air in a different direction. For example, you right. showed a slide of the, of the hurricane in the middle of that data center. You could put some partial curtains in a data center and make that air move in a little different way. What is the actual definition of partial containment? So it's a hundred. So you're trying to get to a hundred percent containment. If you feel that you're at the in eighty percent containment or seventy percent containment, so it's all in percentages. Ninety percent containment. How much of the airflow streams? So let's take plumbing for a quick second. You have your supply plumbing and your return plumbing. Those plumbing in your house, those are two totally different. They're never going to cross. Those are a hundred percent contained with inside of them, them uh, each other. In the airflow. The second something, your hot air mixes with your cold air, that is not contained. So look at your data center, and that's 100% of your data center, how much of that percentage-wise is contained. Simple ways, to, simple ways to do partial containment, go up only as far, like the sprinkler head, like I said, the sprinkler head is going to be your problem. Go up as far as the sprinkler head and stop. It doesn't go all the way to the ceiling. It's not all the way 100% contained, but stop. You'll get enough airflow and enough movement that you will most likely stop that recirculation air from coming around the, the front side of the cabinet, and your sprinkler spread will still be able to, in a fire event, still be able to do its job. So partial containment is anything below, upper, is, is a percentage, anything below 100%. All right. There's another question here, and this comes up a lot when we ask when we have webinars and we talk about uh, contained solution is with hot aisle containment, uh, what are the OSHA guidelines for working in that hot aisle? Do you know of any or are there any, is there a downside to working in a 100 degree aisle other than you'll sweat a little bit? Right. Um, they, they, there's definitely a concern out there. I have yet to go and I've had one, only one conversation with one end user, very large end user, um, and OSHA was starting to poke around, poke, poke questions around to them of, you know, how hot is the aisle, what are you doing in there, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I have yet to hear anybody getting um, nailed, so to speak, or written up or, in, or any of that nature, ta taking any action for a hot aisle containment. It is definitely a concern on everybody's mind, but I've yet to hear anybody, any statute, anything come out of that. Okay. So we'll just keep listening and see what we hear, but as of right now, we haven't had any issues with that that we know of today, correct? Correct. And, the, and I'll add one more little thing to that. The only thing I think why that is, or because it's a gray area, an aisle containment is still not considered an occupied space. You only go in there for a little bit, you come out of there for a little bit, you go back in, you're working on a server, you're doing stuff like that. It's not 100% occupied. It's not like it's an office building and you're sitting in there for eight hours a day and you're occupying it. So that's the, that, that's the gray area that I think people are trying to figure out what, where, why, and how. So keep, definitely keep on, the, uh, keep on the hunt. And if you find a, anybody coming across this problem, I'd love to know about it. Definitely email us, uh, email us at Chatsworth or Graybar. We'd love to hear about it. All right. Um, Jeff asked a question about ideas with fire suppression, and here's the problem he has. He describes it this way. Seems to be a big issue, especially with 
cold contained ceilings. In other words, you're going to put a lid uh, on the row, <laughs> and now the yeah. sprinkler is not going to reach through the lid. Now, the real answer to this is we can go to chimneys, let's say, and we can go to a deeper cabinet, and uh, rather than put a lid, we can just direct the air straight up if from if the wall is actually built in the back of the cabinet. Is there other solutions other than chimneys that would get around yeah. that? And then the other yeah. thing, what, what about the authority having jurisdiction in terms of they may approve it if you put a lid on it? Uh, what's your experience there? Yes, the, the first the first call is the authority having jurisdiction and let them you know un understand what you're doing in the data center. But uh, the cold aisle again could be a lid style, or you can build two walls on either side going from so on your cold aisle you have a front face of your cabinet on one side front face of your cabinet, and if you went straight up with a um, with two containment walls so to speak, you're still containing the cold aisles, but you're doing it on the on on. You're, you're still containing, but you're doing it on the cold side. So you're building basically a whole row chimney all the way up. You can ver variably stop at the sprinkler heads and let the sprinkler heads still do their jobs, and that might be enough containment for you to get you out of your problems or get you to the next level of you want to bring in new servers or something like that. So don't only think of just cold aisle as a lid style. Think of it as true isolation, true containment, and no matter what style you do on what aisle you do, you can get around those things. There's been plenty of customers that we've contained, quote unquote, contained their cold aisle, and we've only, they've had a, let's say a three foot from top of the cabinet to the bottom of the ceiling, they've only had three foot there. But we only went up a foot and a half and called it good because that, that gave them enough segregation of their airflow to get them where they wanted to go. Again, partial containment, not 100%, but got them where they needed to go. Uh, the ta I'm assuming here that the taller the ceiling would be your friend. Yes, yes. When, when, when stratification happens and the, the, the hotter air rises, the, cold, the colder, denser air pushes out that hot air um, and, and pushes it up so the cold air stays down the bottom and that, that there's, no fan, there's very little fans that can draw that back down from a very high ceiling and try to mix that air again. So it really helps you out in that, in that sense. Um, Mike asked a question about melting the tops away. Um, can, it, can the hot aisle get hot enough that it's going to destroy a, a, a ceiling if you choose to put one in? You, I mean, you could. You could. Most of them are fire rated already. Uh, your your flash point has to be at. Um, you, you know, your flash point on most stuff is above 300 degrees. Um, so it. it I, I've very rarely seen anything melt. You know, melt away where it's way too hot. There's a UL specification that on the back of the servers, the hottest the back of a server can get is uh, um, 39 degrees C. That is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The reason they do that is anything above that, you wouldn't be able to touch that metal because it, it, would, it would start burning your hand. you get a second degree burn. So um, if the server manufacturers are doing what they should be doing and staying within that spec, the hot air should not rise above 150 degrees in reality. Um, so you could, you, you, at, at a certain point, melting panels and flashing over and all that kind of stuff but wouldn't even come into play yet. Uh, Mike, Mike, who asked that question, provided a little bit more detail. So what, he, what Mike was really getting at is from a fire protection uh, sure. uh, point of view, if the, top would, if the top would melt away if there was a fire, um, then, uh, then you didn't have to worry about ret retracting that lid uh, because of a fire, because it melted away. So that's where he was right. getting at. Okay, um, so, on, so that, on, that, on that tip, um, the NFPA has outlawed that as of last year. There can nothing in your, in your containment, there can nothing be heat activated. It has to be mechanical and it has to be uh, tied back to your uh, VESDA system or your ver very early detection system of your, um, of your fire suppression system. So those fusible links, what we used to call the shrinky-dink panels where they would shrink down and fall out, 
those are no longer allowed by the NFPA. Your fire marshal, when you when you have a, a, a final uh, inspection for occupancy inside your building, the fire marshal is going to kick that out very, very quickly. That was ratified last year, and nothing heat activated can be. Um, it's a great idea. I love the idea, but here's what happens. You have a fire event in one corner of your room. That's the hottest it is. All of those panels are dropped out. Nothing on the other side has been dropped out, and the fire marshal wants everything to drop in unison all at the same time. So where the fire event was, was its hottest, all those things melted away. On the other side of the room, nothing has melted away yet, but you still have smoke, you still have problems over there. The fire marshal wants everything to drop in unison so the fire suppression and um, your ventilation can, can work for you. Um. Mike is suggesting that if we can get that reference from the NFPA, we'd like to send it to him because he could use that reference. So we'll respond Absolutely. to Mike's question offline and make sure we email him uh, the link that he needs uh, so he can share that information about the NFPA rules that changed last year. We have time for one more question, and, and there's like two or three of them here that are all the same thing, and people are asking for 3D modeling or calculation, calculating the amount of containment they need etc. Et so what we'll do is I want to let everybody online know that if you'll type the words CFD, CFT, com Computational Fluid Dynamics, CFD, if you will type that on, in the Q&A box and just hit enter, we'll pick that up on our side and we'll respond to you and set up an appointment or talk to you about doing a CFD analysis inside your data center. So if you'll just type CFD, hit the enter button so we can get it. Uh, we'll get back to you and we'll make arrangements uh, to do an analysis in your data center uh, to see how we can help you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, uh, there's other people on the line that also wanted to know the references to the NFPA uh, link that talks about these fusible items that make the ceiling drop away. Uh, we'll, if we get that reference, then we'll post it up to the archive and we'll make it part of the presentation uh, that we uh, post up there. Um, so type CFD if you'd like somebody to come by and take a look at your data center and help you with uh, some of the things you have. If your question was not answered, I can assure you uh, your question will be answered by email. Tom and myself and other resources will get this list and we'll find out what the answers to these questions are and we'll be back to you. Uh, via email. I want to remind you that the presentation is on, will be online, not today, but tomorrow. It will be online, so if you want to look at it again, share the information or whatever you want to do, uh, you can do that. You can get it in our archive. If you're one of the 50 people that were with us on our presentation today, uh, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to uh, um, uh, get a cup of coffee at a local coffee shop. Uh, you know what? Uh, this has been a great presentation, Tom. You went into some details here that we normally don't hear when we get the same old presentations about, uh, about contained solutions. So I want to thank you uh, very much. It was an excellent presentation. I was 100% uh, intrigued by how we can do some containment, whether full or partial, with a limited amount of tools and just a few pieces of hardware. And I want to let you know we'd love to talk to you about that. So if, if you would like to know more about how we can help you move air around in your data center, just type CFD, hit the button. We'll get some resources out there to talk to you. Uh, we thank you for that, and uh, we'll be back with you near soon. Thank you for joining us today on our, on our G2 Talk webinar. Have a great day, and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy your holiday time. Goodbye. Thank you.